اوكي نحمده هو نصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد سو ان شاء الله اس ا سيشن اباوت وات تو لوك فور ان ا بوتنشال وايف سو كونتينيون اون فروم لاست ويك وي توكت اباوت ام وات ا بيرسون شود لوك فور ام ان ا هازباند سو ان شاء الله ذس وانز وات ا بيرسون شود لوك فور ان ا وايف ام لايك اي سيد لاست ويك بيكوز وي اول ذا سيم ثينغ ذات اتس امبورتنت اي جيس نوت جست فور مين تو Um, to understand this, but it's important for women to understand it as well, because then it gives an idea of what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was encouraging men, who the Prophet peace be upon him was encouraging men to marry. So again, it makes us realise that okay, that's some, that's the way that we should uh, try and be. So there's a, a first saying here that when the slave enters uh, matrimony, he has completed half of his religion. Let him now fear Allah regarding the remaining half. So marriage is a very important part of a person's um, Islamic life, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he's actually compared it to uh, completing half of his uh, religion. And then the verse of the Quran that I read last week: "And marry those among you who are single and virtuous ones, among your slaves. If they be poor, Allah will enrich them out of His bounty, and Allah is all sufficient for His creatures' needs, all knowing." So again. Uh, reiterating that um, when a person's getting married, then obviously there is a worry about the finances and will I be able to manage. Um, so to a certain extent, a person must ensure that, especially for a Muslim man, if he's getting married, that he is able to at least provide accommodation, food, you know, pay the bills, etc., um, clothing for his wife. Then at least that person could get married. But to worry too much about it, Um, isn't correct because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who provides. Um, so this means that a person should continue to work but um, not worry too much uh, about uh, the income at this, uh, on the same hand. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, when one spends upon his family with the intention and hope of reward, it is for him charity. So because a person might worry about um, finances, And I've said, obviously, finances are important. The bare minimum is important. But not to worry too much about it is because when a person gets married, Allah will, inshallah, increase their provision. But also, the more that a person spends on their family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept that as charity. And we know that charity increases a person's wealth. Whereas withholding of zakat it causes the punishment of Allah. causes the destruction of wealth. So it almost seems the opposite to what it looks like. It looks like when you're giving charity, you're getting poorer, but yet Allah is telling us, the Prophet is telling us, no, you'll get richer. And when a person is not giving in charity, it seems like they're holding on to the money, so they're going to remain rich. In actual fact, they're told that, you know, they're going to be punished for it and that their wealth could be destroyed as a result of it. So these are something that we have to bear in mind. And as a Muslim man going into a marriage, uh, we have to be willing to spend Because why? That spending, inshallah, Allah will give us back more of it in this life, not just after death. And also it will be counted as a reward for us as well. Um, so this is important to, to bear in mind when it comes to a, a man getting married. The most rewarding dinar spent in the way of Allah is on your family compared to freeing a slave or a poor person. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he talked about spending a dinar, which is a gold coin, uh, in charity. And that out of those three categories of people, um, the best was the one who spent it upon uh, his own uh, family. And amongst his signs is that he created for you wives from amongst yourselves, that you may find tranquility in them. And he has created between you affection and mercy. Indeed, herein are signs uh, for people who uh, reflect. So when talking about uh, marriage, then... What a Muslim woman looks for in a, in, a, in a potential husband, some of the things are going to be similar to what a Muslim man looks for in a wife, but there'll be other things that are different. So one of the things that Allah is mentioning in this verse of the Quran that I just read is that, that you may find tranquility in them. So one of the purposes of marriage is actually that a person, especially the man, finds peace within that marriage. Obviously both, but at the moment we're talking about the men. So when getting married, that's something to have in mind. That do I think that I could have a, a tranquil and peaceful life 
uh, with this person. And the things that Allah has mentioned that will come as a result of marriage is affection and mercy. So these are, again, two qualities that a person wants to look uh, within uh, a what's it called, potential spouse. So what else does a um, Muslim man need to uh, look for? Maybe I'll get onto that in a minute, but how does a person go about uh, finding the right person to get married? So we know that in Islam, everything that we do, we want to ensure that we're doing it according to the commandments of Allah. We want to ensure that we're doing it within the framework of Islam. Because our ultimate purpose, our ult ultimate goal is to please Allah to get to Jannah. So if marrying, going down that path, we do it in a way that's against the commandments of Allah, then what's it going to result in? It's not going to result in Jannah, heaven. It's going to result in possibly going to the fire of hell. So we want to ensure that even the marriage that we're we're going to take, we're going to do. It's an important part of our life that it becomes a means of Allah's pleasure. And marriage isn't just for fulfilling uh, the desires. Obviously, that's part of marriage that a person's desires will be fulfilled in a way that's halal. But it's about finding the right person that you're going to live your life with, through which you can bring up a family, and all of you can get to paradise. Yeah. So it's not just fulfilling the desires. So when a person goes to into the process of looking for the right partner. So when a man's looking for the right woman, it's not just about someone that is beautiful and you know a person can enjoy intimacy, but it's more than that. It's, is, would this person be someone who's a good influence on me? Is this person, is their purpose in life in line with my purpose in life? Because if it isn't, then obviously that then uh, creates a problem down the line. Um, and similarly, when a person is then hoping that, inshallah, they'll have children in the future, then will those children be being taught and brought up to want to please Allah or not? So if both parents are on that path, then it will be easier on the children. So that's something that is probably the most important um, criteria that a person should look for, is the piety of the person. Is this person trying to please Allah? It doesn't mean are they perfect, you know, are they doing every single thing, but is that, have they made this their purpose in life? Is this important to them? If it is, then alhamdulillah, that's a good thing. If it isn't, um, and that's your purpose, and it should be your purpose, then that, that becomes uh, quite a bit of a problem. So anyway, so like I said, that how to go about finding uh, the right person. So we can't do anything that's haram. So having a girlfriend, having a boyfriend, that's haram. We're not allowed to do it. Um, being even alone with the opposite sex um, when a person's not either married to that person or not closely related to the extent that they're allowed to be together, then that obviously becomes haram. So for example, a person has a, a colleague that they know at work or something like that, and they spend time alone, you know, in a certain place, then this is uh, haram. Why? Because there's the potential that at some stage in their life, if, they, if circumstances permitted, they could get married. So in that sense, that person becomes, uh, what's it called, haram. Um, and that also includes, like, um, even like the activities that we do here, the Islamic activities. That's why, you know, it's very important that we never leave two people alone, you know, a, a man and a woman, when there is not a third person there. Why? Especially if they're not related. Because then, rather than... Um, obeying the commandments of Allah becomes breaking the commandments of Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned to Nias, meaning that when this happens, when the two people are alone, then the third becomes shaitan. And the shaitan, he then entices and puts thoughts in each other's minds towards the other person. And that could lead towards sin. So Islam doesn't just make things haram, um, but it also makes the steps that a person may take to reach that haram as well. So that's something to bear in mind. So that takes girlfriends, boyfriends, all of these things uh, out of the equation. Um, so what is the right way to go about it? So it's important that when a person's looking to get married, that as much as possible that, that a person can involve their family in that process. So even for a Muslim man, uh, it's important. And not to get attached to uh, the woman before he's got to the stage where he's actually married. Because the same as it would happen for a woman, that once a woman decides that they're in love with that person, 
become, they become blinkered, it becomes difficult to see any faults. So similarly, when a man becomes, you know, falls in love with a, a woman, then after that, if you try and say, but this is wrong and that's wrong, and that, it becomes very difficult because the emotions are there, and especially when the emotions are fresh. So um, for that reason, a person has to be careful uh, to ensure that they've that they, that they go along in the correct steps. So what would normally happen, so what used to happen, for example, at the time of the Prophet uh, وسلم, when it used to come to, to, to marriages, so what would happen is that people would recommend other people. So we have the story of the Prophet وسلم, when um, he, have, he was going through the year of sorrow. So in that year, if I remember correctly, Khadija radiallahu anha had passed away. In that year, um, his uncle Abu Talib had passed away. So he was really getting a hard time as well from the, the Quraysh. And then it was someone from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who then said, what about um, Aisha radiallahu anha, the, the, the person who is the daughter of the Prophet's best friend, Abu Bakr, radi Abu Bakr radiallahu anha. So it was like that being introduced through family. So that's one of the ways that uh, these marriages took place. And similarly, it would happen at the time of the Prophet ﷺ that someone might uh, be interested in uh, someone for the purposes of marriage, and they would then send someone to go and talk to the family, or they would talk to the, the wali, the guardian of that woman, and in that way they would be able to do it. So that's what we have to try and practice uh, today. So if we live within the Muslim community, uh, that's very important, and we actually take an active part, then we get to know people. People get to know us. So when it comes to the point of getting married, then there'll be people that can vouch for us, people that then can have us in mind uh, when uh, they was called, want to recommend, it, recommend us to uh, someone else. So that's something to bear in mind. I mentioned this last week again, but I'll mention it again. So when... what. So, so then when a, a person has to, so before I get to that step, what does a person have to look for in the other person? So what does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he say to us? So he says to us here that a lady is married for one of four reasons, wealth, rank, beauty, or piety. So when it says rank, it means like their family lineage, if they come from a, a kind of high class family or a, a tribe that's very prestigious. So these are the four reasons usually that women are married for uh, at that time. It was for wealth, so they come from a wealthy family. Uh, it was from rank, as in the, the, fa the, the actual family that they came from, the lineage. Beauty or piety, meaning religiousness. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, marry her that possesses piety and achieves success. So this doesn't mean that, so, so for a Muslim man when they're getting married, the first and foremost priority has got to be it does this person practice their religion? Is this person pious? Right. And uh, one of the muftis, he actually explained that, um, so does this mean outwardly practicing Islam? So for example, the hijab, etc., these things. Or does this mean the, in, the kind of social aspect of uh, Islam? So he said, obviously, with regards to marriage, the, the social aspect is very important. What is this person like in their day-to-day -day life? Are they a nice person? Are they a generous person? Are they a caring person? Are they a truthful person? Because these are all parts of Islam. Not to say that wearing the hijab is not important. Obviously, it's compulsory. And uh, praying five times a day, obviously, that's a must. Fasting the month of Ramadan, that's a must. So these are the most important things that a person uh, needs to take care of. Does that mean that these other things that the Prophet mentioned that they should be ignored. So, for example, don't care if what her family is like, don't care what she looks like, or don't care um, how wealthy she is. It doesn't mean that. All it means is that don't make that the number one priority. It's also important, but the most important thing will be piety. Why? Because our ultimate purpose is uh, to, to get to Jannah. There's a story, actually, that uh, highlights this. So Umar radiallahu anhu, who was the second caliph of the Muslims after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it was Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu. So what happened was that he used to go out and like kind of check up and make sure that everybody was okay. So the leaders at those times are not like the leaders today. 
they actually cared about the people. They believed that being the leader meant that you were the servant of the people. They actually, and so he would go out at night just to make sure everything was okay. There wasn't any danger, there wasn't anybody in any problems. There are many stories of this actually, but this is just one night that he was out. So anyway, when he was out, he overheard a conversation between a mother and her daughter. So the mother was saying to the daughter, um, because they had uh, milk that they used to sell during the day. So what she was saying is add water to it. Yeah, because if you add water to the milk, it'll increase the volume. You're going to then sell it, we'll make more money. Obviously, it's a form of deception because someone might come buying what they think is pure milk. In actual fact, it's been diluted with, with water and they're paying the price not for water, but they're paying the price assuming that it's milk. So it's a form of deception. So the daughter, she refused to do it. And she said, uh, and, she, and the mother said, like, basically, what are you scared of? It's not as if Umar is going to know about it. Radiallahu anhu. How is he going to know about it? It's not as if he's here. But he was actually hearing this conversation. So what she then replied, the daughter replied, that Umar radiallahu anhu may not be watching over us, but where can we hide from the Lord of Umar radiallahu anhu? So if, okay, Umar radiallahu is not going to catch us, like, you know, might say the police are not going to catch us, yeah? The boss is not going to catch us. But Allah knows what's going on. So that was the, the condition of that daughter. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he was... Like extremely impressed. So he noted what house it was, because it was during the night. So he went away, and then the next day he sent someone, go and find out um, you know, where that house was and you know what the situation is. And they found out that the, the young woman who had said this uh, was unmarried, she was single, and she was just living with her mum. So it was just her mum and her daughter. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he asked his son, come to speak to you, his son's name was Asim, Asim radiallahu anhu. So he says to him, that son, accept my advice. I have come to know of a girl whose piety and God consciousness have touched me. Let me propose for her hand in marriage on your behalf. I have hope that, inshallah, a pious child will be born from her who will raise the flag of Islam. So this is another important aspect of when getting married is that we want our children to become those people who serve the religion. We want to serve the religion. And we want our progeny to serve the religion of uh, Islam. So anyway, Asim radiallahu anhu, he took his father's advice. So this again is another important thing for Muslim men when they're getting married is be open to advice, whether it's from your father or your uncle or even your mom and your sisters and others. Be open to the advice. We don't know everything. We need to take advice from others. At the end of the day, the decision will be made by the person that's going to get married. But parents especially... Um, they know their children really well. So they'll see the good and the bad of that person. So when they're growing up, they'll kind of know, have an idea that actually I think that this type of woman would be more suitable for you. So he might think, no, I want this type. And the dad might think, that's not according to your character. So anyway, he took that advice and he accepted. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he invited the mother and the daughter. Uh, the girl's character uh, did not uh, disappoint um, and the mother uh, she consented uh, to her daughter getting married to Asim radiallahu anhu uh, and they got married so again in here is another step that we're going to talk about later on which is that it's not just enough that you've got a match as in that person's pious they've got good character etc etc but it is important that you actually meet them in real life because people can be very different on what you've heard of them to, to what they are when you actually meet them. So that's something that's important that has to be, uh, a person has to bear in mind. So anyway, they got married and they had a daughter and she had a child called Umar who became Umar bin Abdulaziz, who became known as the second Umar because of his justice and what he did. So he was, in history, if you read the history of Islam, he was a great and important character. So this resulted as a result of that marriage. So that's an important thing for us to uh, consider when getting married is is this person a person who fears Allah and like I'd mentioned about when the women are getting married that they want to be sure that the husband is pious because even if the marriage doesn't work out because not every marriage works out that at least because that person has a fear of Allah and wants to practice the religion they won't then break their rights, they won't start torturing them and similar on the, on the side of a, a woman, if the woman is someone who 
is practicing Islam, then even if the marriage doesn't work out, okay, there'll be heartbreak and all sorts of grief and whatever, but at least they'll be conscious of Allah and they'll not actually start to um, oppress one another. One of the things that can happen, especially if a marriage breaks down, is that then the, the couple who are now separated, they start taking it out on the children that they've got. You can't see the children, you can't see the children. And then they start filling the children's mind with badness towards each other. So this is haram because you, and, and not only is it just a normal haram, think about it, the, the respect that Islam has given that we should have to our parents, yeah? Uh, under the feet of your mother is Jannah, your father is the door to heaven, okay? So if we know those things and then we're conscious of it, even if the marriage doesn't work out, we wouldn't want our children to now start abusing and being rude towards their parents. Why? Because then they've closed the door to Jannah, which is their father, or Jannah, which is underneath the feet of their mother. So both ways. So it should be that, okay, what does Islam now teach about how these children will be looked after and custody and maintenance and all that? That's a whole, new to a whole different topic. But that's why it's important, inshallah, that a person always looks for piety, uh, first of all. What age should a person start thinking seriously about getting married? Scholars have given different ages, but they reckon that for a, a male, for a boy, probably around about the age of 19 is a good age to get married. And for a girl, maybe around about the age of 17 is a good. So it doesn't mean it has to be fixed on that. But what they say is that it's not usually a good idea to get them married straight away as soon as they've reached puberty. Why? Because they're not mature enough. They've not had a bit of time to kind of settle down as adults. And if you just quickly get them married, sometimes the body hasn't developed and it can then cause a problem, uh, sometimes for the woman as well. Do you know what I mean? And if she gets pregnant quickly and then has a child, her body's not completely developed to that of a woman. So it's very important that uh, a person should not make it too early. But at the same time, the scholars say, don't delay it too long either. That you know, oh, they're going to get married in you know, 10 years' time or whatever. Why? Because the natural desires are there. And if they're not being fulfilled in a halal way, then they have to be fulfilled some way. So what will usually happen is that they'll start going down the path of haram. And then the shaitan's there and, you know, it's open. So that's something you think about. Um, but if you're beyond that age, then obviously uh, you should also be thinking about it as well. Um, there are certain times where it becomes wajib to get married. You know, like we say, like it's, this is a wajib prayer, as in if you don't pray it, it's sinful, like the witr and the isha prayer. Um, so the, you have the farz and then you have the wajib. So both of them are compulsory, but the farz is slightly more sinful if you miss it than the wajib. But both are sinful if you miss it. So, so it, at one stage it becomes such that it is now wajib to get married for a man or a woman. So what stage is that? That's the stage where the probability of committing a sin is very high. So what would a sin be in Islam that would be connected to marriage? Not protecting your eyes. So looking lustfully towards the opposite sex, that would be sinful. Um, there could be, um, you know, masturbation, you know, uh, and as a result, that is a sin. There could also be looking at things that a person is not supposed to look at, whether it's on TV or online or on these places, which can then lead to many other problems. And it could lead to girlfriends and boyfriends. It can lead to zina, having sex outside the fold of marriage. So if a person is at that stage where they're going to commit a sin if they don't get married and they have the ability to get married, then it's wajib to get married. Yeah, you, you, you must get married. So for example, there's a, a man and he's got a job and he's got the income to be able to support a wife. And he's also, um, yeah, so he's able to do that, that's fine. And he's got the desires, and they're that strong that if he doesn't fulfill them in a halal way, it's going to lead him to haram. The person should get married. Yeah, that's it. it becomes important. And if the person doesn't have the desire that strong, but he has the ability to be able to uh, look after a wife financially, then he should still get married. But that's known as a sunnah rather than it becoming wajib. And there's times where it's impermissible to get married, and I think that's important because a lot of times someone will actually, it tends to happen from the boy's side that they just think, get him married, get him married. But they don't look to see, is this guy actually going to be able to look after a woman? 
Yeah, like, okay, he might have the finances, but maybe he's living a really reckless lifestyle. That's going to destroy someone else's life, yeah, if they, if they get together. So you'll hear that quite common that, you know, someone's uh, son is misbehaving and they think, how are we going to settle him down? Get him married. He gets married. Uh, sometimes it can be to someone abroad that's just happy to get married because they're told they get together and that woman's life gets absolutely destroyed. And on the other hand, it can also happen sometimes the daughter can be quite wild. She's off the rails and they're like, how are we going to settle her down? Get her married. And again, that can lead to all sorts of problems for the, the guy who comes into the marriage not knowing that. So there are times where it's impermissible. So it's impermissible to marry if there is a real fear that you're unable to fulfill the rights of your spouse, whether physical or material. Then in that, set, in that, point, at that point, you would not get married. So when looking for a person to get married, one of the questions that comes up for Muslim men is that um, we can get married to a Jewish or a Christian uh, woman, whereas Muslim women can only get married to Muslim men. Does that mean that they should go ahead and do that? Uh, the scholars have said no, they shouldn't. The best is get married to a Muslim woman, a practice of Muslim woman. Why? Because you both have religion in common. Yeah, You'll both be able to raise your kids up with one religion, and it'll be much beneficial, you'll help one another. The scholars give certain reasons why Islam allowed this to happen. So they said, for example, the, that the, the husband generally, he has more authority in the house. So if his wife is Christian or Jewish, so they're already following the religion of a prophet and with a holy book, so there's more chance that over time she could become Muslim because of the influence of the husband. And maybe they're living in an Islamic society. So that would be one of the reasons. Or there might be the, a, a, a time where, for example, all around them, there are not enough Muslim women to get married to. And the only ones that are available are Christian and Jewish women. So, okay, that would be permissible to do. But it's not recommended that a person do it. And some of the scholars, they actually say, especially if you're living in a society um, which is not Muslim, then it's very important uh, to be careful. Why? Because what happens many times is the guy isn't actually that strong in his religion anyway. And he gets married to someone out of the fold of Islam, Jewish or Christian. And then later on, he then leaves practice in Islam. Not that he leaves Islam completely, but he doesn't really think of it as important. Why? Because she doesn't think of it as important. It's not something that's important in that house. So that's something just to bear in mind for uh, Muslim guys. Um, okay, so what is it that men look for in marriage? So they say, so like we mentioned last time, what women generally look for. Um, but what do men look for? Men generally have a natural need towards affection, friendship, and war and warmth, which um, would come in the form of a wife. So although men like to be macho, you know, we are strong and we don't need anybody. Um, we do, because even our greatest grandfather, Adam, Saram, the first man, yeah, he needed a woman. You know, he had heaven, he was living in Jannah, but there was an emptiness within him. And Allah created from his rib, his wife, Hawa, Eve, uh, peace be upon her. And then in paradise, he felt happy. Imagine that you're in paradise, but in paradise, you're still not happy. So there's something very important uh, for a Muslim man uh, that comes from a Muslim woman. Um, and so these are the qualities that, that are important, is that, yes, they need affection, some sort of friendship uh, and warmth within the marriage. Um, so when I mentioned earlier on, remember that the four points about getting married, I mentioned that there's uh, piety, there's beauty, there's family, and there's wealth. It mentions here that um, why should a person... Um, not go for the other things but instead go for piety because one of the things that's mentioned is that beauty is something that it doesn't last forever do you know I mean? especially youthful beauty because we're all going to get old so there as a result do you know what I mean we don't look the way we looked when we were younger so beauty is something that it can be there today and it can be gone tomorrow wealth is something that is here today and it can go tomorrow it, the other thing is that sometimes the extreme beauty of a person can actually affect their character. So that rather than being a nice person, it can lead the person to being a bad person. And also it can be a means of attracting a lot of attention. So it can have um, a negative side to it as well. 
And with regards to wealth, what can happen is sometimes the excess of wealth, it corrupts a person, men and women. Too much wealth, you know, there's many examples of people who, when they don't have much, they're all okay. As soon as they get a little bit of money, then you start to see the bad side coming out. So that can also be something. So these are not things to uh, focus on. So family can help in the process of getting married um, by asking the boy his opinion. Yeah, not just to assume that because the family's involved, you just get the person married off and you don't take into consideration uh, what that person actually wants. You think you know what's better for them. And there are many examples. I've seen it where I actually had a friend who was telling me that their mum was saying to them they should get married to this woman from Pakistan because she would be able to have someone in the house who would look after her. And he's like, I don't have any feelings towards her. Actually, I've got someone on the other side who's, you know, a girlfriend from, and who's from Scotland, whatever. What should I do? I mean, well, rather you should get married to the person that you're having a haram relationship with and make it halal. And then don't waste this other woman's life. And alhamdulillah, he did. He actually went ahead and he'd done that, um, which was good. And if I remember correctly, actually, she, well, who he got married to, she actually became Muslim uh, as well. So that's something to, to, to bear in mind. Find out what does the, the boy actually want out of this marriage. Now, sometimes when you approach someone to ask them and they're young, they might be shy, like they don't want to tell their mum, they don't want to tell their dad. So what the ulama say is that the way to find out is speak to their friends. Ask them, you know, you're such and such friend. Has he mentioned anything to you? Or ask cousins, you know, has he mentioned anything to you? And in this way, you get an idea from them. And at least when you're going out to help find someone for your son, then you've got a better idea in your mind what that person is looking for. Or they might be open about it, and they should be open about it. If a person's getting married, it's not a time to be extremely shy. Be open about it. What is it that you're looking for in the person that you're going to marry? Um, so anyway, so how do, you, how do you go about doing this? So once you, your parents go out, or you might even come across someone and you think, I'm interested in that person, so you can get the families involved and you can see, first of all, is this person pious? Yeah. Um, does this person have good qualities? Is this someone that has a similar outlook on life that I have? Yeah. And if all things seem to click and they seem to uh, tick the boxes, then what happens is you move to the next stage. And the next stage is where you have a meeting, yeah, where they actually get to sit face to face. Now, in some cultures, this is Islam, even Muslim cultures, this is frowned upon. They see it as un-Islamic. Well, how could I do that? They should just get married based on a photo, or even without a photo, just the fact that someone put them together, and then they go and they get married. But the problem is that then later on in the marriage, that can lead to, lead to problems, and it's against the teachings of the Prophet. The Prophet uh, taught that that meeting is important. That go there, actually see one another and see is there an actual attraction to one another. And at that point, you get to speak to a person. And sometimes just by speaking to someone, you might get the feeling that, nah, this is not the person. Do you know what I mean? Just through a conversation. Yeah, everything else up until then was going uh, good. Um, so this is something that should, uh, that should happen. Also, after they've had that conversation and it seems like things are uh, okay, then what would happen is you would move to the, uh, the next stage, which is uh, investigating, finding out, is there anything about this person that uh, I should know? So when going into a marriage for, or, going, or going into looking to get married, you should be very open and honest with people about who you are, what you're all about and not hide things from uh, one another. Why? Because you're going to go into a marriage and it's going to come out at some point. So, but some people will hide these things. So what are we allowed to do as Muslims? You're not allowed to usually go about asking about people. But in the process of ma marriage, or if you're going to do a business with someone, then you are allowed to go and ask people. And usually, you know, people wouldn't be allowed to tell you something about someone because that would be backbiting. But in the case of marriage and business, if someone, tell, if someone comes to you and asks that, look, my, I'm interested in getting married to this person, what do you know about the person? What do you think? Then actually you have an obligation to be honest with that person, even if that means telling something about that person that's not good. So, for example, if you know that in regards to business, for example, that this person, he's, you know, 
he, he's uh, conned a few people before. You can say, actually, this guy's conned this person, this person, this person. Don't do business with them. Now, if you know that and you don't reveal it, then that's sinful. And similarly, in marriage, you might know, so for example, the, the guy's looking to get married or the woman's looking to get married, but the woman's got things in her past that she's done that are wrong, that no one's talking about. So therefore, for someone to mention that and say, actually, this person has done X, Y, and Z, if they've actually done it, there's nothing wrong with that. Actually, they should do that so that the person is warned. So both do that, the husband, the potential husband and wife, will, their families will both be doing this. So what's one of the ways that this can be done? For example, you know where that person works. So you might know people that work with them. So you can ask them. And the families can ask them. You know, what's your, what, what do you think of this person? What's your interaction with this person? And people will start to tell you. You can um, maybe go to the mosque where they go. Ask the people that are there, the imam or something. Do you know such and such? What do you know of them? Yeah. So in the, and in, in the same thing with regards to the women, what would you do? You could ask your female relatives that go and find out, ask other women, what do they know about this woman? And in that way, there might be things that you find out that are big things that become an issue that people are, that are hiding. And then hopefully what happens is it doesn't. It comes back that everything's good. And if it comes back everything's good, then you don't need to go crazy. Yeah? You're not allowed to do like un-Islamic things. You can't like hack into their email and you know, uh, start, what's it called, um, recording them or secretly or whatever. You're not allowed to go that extent, do you know what I mean? But it is important that you, what's it called, uh, you try and find out. And then if everything seems to go well from there, um, what you'll do then is after the meeting, you'll ask each other, you know, or the families may ask each other, what do you think? Yeah, she's still interested in him. He's still interested in her. Then what happens is you do what's called istikhara. So istikhara is a prayer that you do uh, before you go to bed at night. So it's two nuffal. Um, you pray the two nuffal and you read the du'a of istikhara. At two points in the du'a, usually when you get it in a book, it's underlined. Had al Amri is this matter that you're actually considering. You can then say what it is. So, for example, should I marry and mention the person's name? Okay, this happens for three days to one week. At the end of it, so you, you repeat this process every night for that period of time. At the end of it, if in your heart it still you're you're sure yes, this seems like the right thing to do, then Alhamdulillah, that's a good sign that you should go ahead and do it. And all along the process, you're also doing something which is called mashwara. So mashwara is that you're consulting with others, you're consulting with your family, you're consulting with your friends, you're consulting with people that have got the knowledge of these things. And they're all coming back and saying, yeah, actually, we think it's okay. You've met the person, you click, you're attracted to one another, that's okay. You've checked everything from the background, background everything seems all right. You've done your istikhara and it's come up positive. Now a person can then decide, okay, I want to get married. So it might happen, unfortunately, that a person might, the ristikhara might come out and they might say, yeah, I'm ready. And the other person does the ristikhara and says, actually, no, I don't want to go ahead with it. Because that can happen. Yeah, it can happen. So then obviously it wouldn't go any further. But if it was now going to go further than that, um, then what would happen is that they would then give a verbal promise to get married. Yeah? So this would be like the equivalent of an engagement. So there's no need to exchange rings. There's no need to throw a party or anything like that. All that would happen is that uh, they would have made an agreement to get married. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that when uh, a match is found uh, for a woman, then don't delay it. Yeah? Get married as soon as possible. You can delay it. Sometimes what happens actually, because there's different ways of getting married. So someone can do the nikah, and then they move in straight away. Yeah? So they marry and then they live together as a couple straight away. Sometimes what can happen is they can do the nikah, the marriage, and then they can move in later on. Yeah? So, so like for example, students, because that's a thing that comes up with students that I'm studying. Should I wait till I've finished my studies before I get married? Or should I get married while I'm studying? So what can happen is that a person can continue to look while they're studying find someone and then say, okay, we'll do the nikah now and maybe we won't move in until after we've finished our studies. Yeah, maybe a year or whatever. Or they can make some sort of alternative arrangement. But the best way would be you agree to get married, you get married shortly after that and then you move in with one another and then that you're living, a, what was it called, an Islamic and halal life.
So I think that's kind of covered most of uh, the topic from the point of view of um, what a what's it called Muslim man should look for uh, when getting married to a Muslim woman.